Hello, everyone. This is John Adolfi with the Lost World Museum. And again, we asked a provocative and important question. Where do we come from? Apes, aliens, or Adam? And today we have a special guest that is going to share with us an artifact that may just help solve the origins question, or at least add another piece to this enigmatic ign puzzle. And uh, what we, we have here is Dave Wetzel from New Hampshire. <laughs> and uh, welcome to our program here, Dave. Hey, John, it's so good to be able to join you and the various viewers. We're excited to be able to talk about a special artifact that I have in our collection here at Genesis Park. And I do think it will certainly give some wondrous clues about origins. For those of you that want to check out uh, Dave's uh, website, we'll have it in our description there, but genesispark.com is where you want to go. Now, this is a very contentious discussion, not between Dave and I, but I mean, I'm talking about the origins question. On one side, you have what they call creationism. That's the idea that humans were created by God, that the earth is, well, at least life on earth is not that old, six to 10,000 years, and that everything was disrupted during a worldwide global flood of Noah, some 44 to 4,500 years ago. And that what we see in from fossils to coal, to the geological column, is the result of that great horrific event some 4,400 years ago. So, is there proof one way or the other? I mean, evolutionists uh, claim that they have all the evidence and they have they are the rightful heirs of all evidence. Well, when you see a fossil, it just shows that something died, but it doesn't tell you when it did. All it is says that there was something that was there at one time. So we look for things. And Dave has something that I found out about myself. It's called the, the Newton Bell. From 2005, I heard about this. And I did a little bit of research into it, spoke to the original owners. Dave's going to tell us all about that, this fascinating story. Um, and it was an object that was found in coal. Now, let me show you something here. This right here is another object that was found in coal. Now, it's an iron cup, and this iron cup was found in 1912 at a municipal power plant. And the story goes that uh, in Thomas, Oklahoma, these two men found a big chunk of coal. They broke it open, and this fell out. Now, this is a facsimile of the original coal cup, which is now on display at the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. Now, what's a coal, what's a, what's a piece of coal doing with an iron cup in it? Well, the conclusions are this, either the man or the men that found this are liars, or they really did find it. And if they did find it, then we have a problem. What's the problem? The problem is you have a human artifact that's no more than 3,500, 5,500 years old, and you have it in coal, which is estimated according to the uh, accepted dates. And I'm just going to give you one instead of a, a instead of a range about 300 million years. So for 300 million years, there's a human artifact in it. Well, of course, these men had to be liars, because how in the world can you find that in this? Now, unfortunately, we don't have the two pieces of, of coal, and we only have their testimony in the cup. The cup does have traces of coal in it. That's interesting. So coal should not have that. So, okay, so what are the possibilities? Possibilities are is that humans lived 300 million years ago. That's one possibility. Or... This was actually found in coal, which means that coal, this is an actual piece of coal, is not that old. That this was formed, and again, from the creationist standpoint, 4,500 years ago during the worldwide flood. So in summary, we've seen already that coal can form quickly, or it takes a long period of time. Again, depending on which you which lens you view it through creationism or evolution that this iron coal this iron pot and coal is either two men lying that it actually popped out of a large chunk of coal or they were telling the truth that humans are either 300 million years old 
or this was caught up in a worldwide flood some 4,500 years ago. Now, Dave is going to show us another artifact that was found in coal. And Dave, go for it. Let me, let me give a little bit of background, John, as we start. So as John said, this is an artifact that's been called the Newton Bell after a guy uh, by the name of Newton Anderson. And Newton Anderson, as a 12-year-old young man living in West Virginia way back in 1944, his job, his chores around the house was to keep the coal fire banked. For those of you that aren't familiar with the uh, coal furnace, it's just a matter of taking chunks of coal, lifting up the door and putting these chunks of coal in the, in the in the furnace to keep it going to keep the house warm and so this is his job to do now remember this is way back in world war ii time frame so newton anderson takes a coal shovel goes over to the coal bin and it's evening so he gets a big chunk to last till morning as he's carrying it on the coal shovel the coal shovel starts to kind of bobble a little bit this chunk of coal falls down hits the cement floor and breaks in two and Newton says, uh, I saw something kind of sticking out of this chunk of coal, and it looked a little bit like to him a gun. Now he's 12 years old, and it's World War II, and it's a piece of metal sticking out. He says, well, it looks kind of like a gun. So he puts the remainder of the coal on the fire there on the furnace and takes this chunk with the metal sticking out, sets it aside, and says, I'll deal with that in the morning. And so in the morning, he gets a croquet mallet, <laughs> and he knocks at it until he uh, ups, um, takes it from the coal uh, extracts a metal object that is a bell. Now, as uh, John said a minute ago, this is a little bit strange. You look at this coal from West Virginia, and uh, this this is old coal. This is coal that's supposedly 290 million years ago. This is from the Paleozoic era, the Carboniferous period, and the Pennsylvanian epoch. And so 290 million years ago is before even the time of my friends, the dinosaurs. I mean, I love dinosaurs. I'm known as Dino Dave. But was there a bellosaurus going around making bells? I mean, not likely. So what is this bell doing in a lump of coal? Well, as a young man, Newton Anderson only thought of this as kind of a strange artifact. It didn't necessarily know the significance for the origins debate. So he puts it up on his mantle, and there it sits. And, uh, and then some years later, John Morris goes to that area in uh, West Virginia, Buchanan, uh, West Virginia, and he's speaking at a church. Newton Anderson goes to the church, and he hears about the worldwide flood and how this flood in the creationist model made these large coal seams. And so he says, well, i got to talk to him afterwards. And so he goes up to Dr. John Morris, uh, who was uh, studying at that time at the University of Oklahoma, and says, I found this bell and a lump of coal. Well, Dr. John got very excited and said, can I borrow that? Took it with him to the University of Oklahoma and did a analysis, a metallurgical analysis on this. Come to find out it's a bronze bell. And uh, this bronze bell has a iron clapper. The clapper is the little piece inside that goes back and forth, right? And so you have bronze bell, iron clapper. Genesis chapter four says Tubal-Cain was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So they're working brass and iron in the pre-flood world. Here you have a brass bell with an iron clapper found in a coal seam that's supposed to be 290 million years old. What's going on here? As you said, John, it's a bit of a problem. It's uh, what we would call an ooh part, an out-of-place artifact. And uh, we've got a few of these uh, that are kind of interesting, and uh, you've mentioned one of them already. And there's a couple of others that are out there. We just don't have a lot of artifacts that we would say are antediluvian or pre-flood artifacts. Uh, but this bell and coal is one of them, and it's an exciting. It is exciting. And, you know, to think that this was found in coal, along with this iron pot was found in coal. Friends, let me just say this. If you're involved with coal in any way, whether grandpa was and has something kicking around the house that was found in coal, or you find something that is modern that was found in coal, please feel free to contact either one of us. We would love to hear it. So, Dave, you got a chance to, when did you actually see the bell itself yourself personally? Well, I actually heard about this back in the 90s uh, from a book called Ammunition by Norm, Norm Sharbaugh. So I'm dubious, 
fellow, you know, I've got a master's degree in biology and you want to do inquiry correctly. And so you like to verify your sources. You like to, you know, confirm things. And so I said, okay, I want to, before I, you know, start talking about this or get too excited about it, I want to talk to this guy and just see what Newton Anderson has to say for himself. So I tried to find him, couldn't find him. I understand you, you tried as well, John. Uh, but I was, I was a pretty uh, stubborn, uh, persistent cuss. And so I called every single Anderson in the entire state of West Virginia in the phone book. <laughs> it took me months and I couldn't find him. I, you know, I talked to people. I'm like, do you know of a Newton Anderson? Do you know of a guy that found a bell and coal? And they're like, oh no, you're crazy. You know? And so I, okay, I'll call the next one, next one, next one. And uh, then uh, just for good measure, because I had no success, I tried Virginia as well, thinking maybe get the state wrong. They are next to each other after all. And it took me more months, even more months than West Virginia. It's a bigger state. Uh, but eventually uh, I ran across a friend that said, hey, I know of Newton Anderson. He actually was my Sunday school teacher at my church when I lived back in West Virginia. He now lives in South Carolina. And I said, oh my goodness, you're kidding me. So. We managed to connect with him. I went down and uh, I brought a video camera and I interviewed him. I got the whole story down exactly right. Put it all on my website. And uh, But I asked him when I got done, I said, hey, Newton, what are you going to do with this this wonderful artifact, with this bell and coal? And Newton was at that time, I think, you know, early 80s. Now he's been as well up in his 90s. And he said, uh, well, it's funny you should ask. My kids are just telling me, Dad, you're getting older. You need to do something with that. Because uh, we don't know what they want done with it. So while you're alive, do something with it. And uh, he said, I've had an offer from Ripley's, believe it or not. I've had an offer from a large museum. And uh, I guess I had some notoriety that was on uh, ancient secrets of the Bible and some other TV programs. And so people knew of it. It's in some books and things at this point. It was kind of infamous. And so I said, well, you know, I'm a creationist and I'd be interested in buying it. He said, well, yeah, because I don't want it to disappear in some, you know, the bowels of some museum and never be seen again. So we worked out a deal and I was able to purchase this artifact, the bell found in called the Newton Bell. And I've had it now for a number of years. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> some are going to say, well, Newton Anderson is lying. And I know that you wanted to I'm sure you didn't think he was a liar, but at the same time, before you actually purchased it, you wanted to find out absolutely for sure that there wasn't any deception. Right. We would, what we'd like to have seen would be maybe if it had been left in coal. As, as a scientist, that's what you want. Is you want to have the best confirmation possible. Uh, maybe great to have an eyewitness, you know, great to have video camera control. But hey, look, it's a kid. He's in his basement. <laughs> you don't always get your optimal scenarios in life it just doesn't happen that way um but you know you, you'd wish that he had left some coal on and stuff like this but what i thought the very least we could do is get a polygraph test so my conditions for buying this thing from him was that he would go ahead and take a lie detector test and so i hired the best polygraph examiner i could this guy i uh, did death row cases uh, through the mid-south so I get this this guy to come in. He hooks up Newton to all the equipment, all the gear, and uh, we ask him all the questions, and it checks out. And uh, Newton passed with flying colors, and I have the polygraph examiner's report on my Absolutely. website. Absolutely. And you can see this on, on Dave's site, genesispark.com. So check it out. That's wonderful. And tell me, what were the results of that? Uh... Well, you passed with flying colors, and I bought the bell, and, and I've actually got it with me here, John. Would you like to see it? I think not only would I like to see it, but I think everybody else would like to see it. Yes, please. So this is this is the actual Anderson Bell, the new Anderson Bell. And as you can listen, it still works. <laughs> it still rings real well. But here's a, here's a little bit of a look inside this thing, and you can see it's just amazingly good detail. Wow. Uh, you can see the little clapper there. It kind of... That's the iron clapper. And uh, and you've got this really fine workmanship. It's got a nice sheen to it. Of course, you know, Newton scraped all the coal off of it. It has uh, this little uh, kind of beadwork here kind of coming up. And then up top, it has this you know, very interesting little uh, demonic figure. It's you, kneeling, you make, it yeah, has could these you... wings, and it has, uh, has a little bit of a cap or head crest type of thing on it. 
up there. You bring that closer to the camera, the the, the little figurine. Yeah. And um, you turn that around. I'd like to see the back side of it too. Okay. Interesting. Critics are going to say that again, that maybe this was found in reconstituted. And this is one of the criticisms of anything found in coal, that the coal became reconstituted, like it was in a powder form. And then this fell into it while it was a slurry, I guess, right? Yeah, that would probably, probably be the number one criticism, at least if you look out there on the web, is that uh, they, they can't very well say, well, Newton is just outright lying because he would have failed the polygraph test, right? So what, sure. they, what they have to say is, well, maybe Newton was deceived. And so the, the the best theory that I think is out there is that uh, that this was perhaps a modern production. Uh, it does bear a resemblance to some of the bells from uh, uh, India, for example, the Hindu bells. And uh, there's a, a particular uh, god called Garuda. He's the mount. Uh, in other words, Vishnu, the god, uh, rides on top of Garuda and flies around. So he has wings like this. And oftentimes he's depicted on actually on top of a ceremonial bell. So it bears this superficial resemblance to a Garuda bell that's in the Hindu religion. So um, you, you look online, you might see a theory like this. Well, there was an Indian and he had one of these Garuda bells and he's coming through and he happens to be coming over, you know, the area there, West Virginia, and he drops it and it falls into some kind of a crevice, some kind of seam. And this happens to be, have some coal down in there. Well, over time, some of the coal kind of is eroding away and it kind of goes down to the bottom of the seam in, in dust and in chunks, along with whatever sticks and leaves and things like this. But the water goes down in there and then it dries and it kind of rehardens it, kind of like reforms. And so this is, would be kind of, um, Newton got fooled or maybe the guy that did the mining got fooled and thought it was really pure you know, chunk of coal, but in reality, it's just this kind of reconstituted coal slurry, uh, coal dust, wet coal dust, and, and, and you can kind of re-harden, uh, kind of concrete, like a concrete sort of a thing. Right. And so that's the number one theory that's out there. Now, I, I talked to Newton about this, and he just laughed. He said, I didn't know anybody from out of state. That's how thick it was when I grew up, much less somebody from India coming through. We would <laughs> Nobody came through like that. Uh, it wasn't until World War II where anybody had even been outside, you know, the country anywhere roundabouts. So it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, fly in that way. But then I began to do a little more analysis and actually went down there, yeah, to that area and, and got to see Newton Anderson's original house, got pictures of that, and that's all on my website. Um, but I was talking to some folks, and as a as a Yankee, I'm from New Hampshire. I didn't realize this, but in coal country, at least down that area. They have separate ownership for the land and the mineral rights. So, for example, person A might own, you know, so many acres, but he might not own the mineral rights. So person B owns the mineral right on the same land. And so anytime he wants, he can go in and he can take the minerals off the land. He's got to reclaim the land and, you know, you know, cover it back over again and put grass seed or whatever. But he has the rights to mine it and to take those, to take that coal out of it. And so... Uh, because of the fact that you know you're able to have these uh, track these things, we were able to trace back the original mine. Now we know the gentleman that was mining in that area in Peel Tree, actually, and uh, this is the gentleman that uh, Newton Anderson gave me in the interview long before I even bought the bell. And so we were able to trace back his mineral rights and see where he was mining. Now, why is this important? Well, you have to understand, John, there's two types of mining that takes place in coal country. Uh, the first kind of mine is what's called a strip mining operation or a surface mining operation. And maybe you can think about a carpet that's laying on top of the floor. And basically what you've got is overburden or dirt and grass and, and materials like this that you take off in the strip mining process to reveal the underlying coal seam. Then you take the coal out, and then you just, of course, can you know, put the dirt back again. It'd be like picking the carpet up off the floor to kind of get to what's underneath it. That's strip mining. Mm. And uh, and then the second type of mining is called a shaft mine. And this is something you maybe seen in the movies and stuff like this, where it basically looks like a cave. And there might be, you know, uh, railroad tracks going down in there for the car, uh, but it's dug into a mountain. It's going 
back. It's a shaft that goes into a mountain and you're following the coal seam because it's not right on the surface. It's going into a hill. And so you kind of mm. follow the coal seam and dig, 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 digging in yep. like a mole and supporting as you go. And so those are two kinds of mines. Now, what's uh, important for our you know, existing debate here is that if it was a surface mine, it'd be a little bit more credible that somebody might could drop something and it would go down into a crevice. If, on the other hand, it's a mine that goes into a mountain, it, you, you're just not going to drop something and land down in there. It's not going to go through solid rock uh, for hundreds of feet. And it turns out that this was a shaft mine. And in fact, we found the remnants of uh, this fellow's old buggy. And the Newton said, that's it. That's his buggy that he did delivery with. So it all kind of checked out uh, with the mineral rights. And it was kind of cool. But it's it's a shaft mine. Uh, but then, you know, if, if, if anybody from coal country, look, if, if you're from coal country, you know coal, you're not going to buy a, a you know, reconsolidated coal slurry with a bunch of dirt and junk in it. It's not going to burn. You know, they call the cheap brownish coal lignite. And, and they just throw it away. It's absolute garbage. They burn hard by tuminous coal, uh, like what John showed you a minute ago. Uh, kind of rare to get anthracite, which is kind of like the, the nice shiny stuff. But uh, by tuminous coal, that's that's what they, I mean, this is coal country. They know what they're dealing with. That's what they're going to pay for. And when they're going to put something on the fire, that's what they're going to put on the fire. And uh, so to think that this is somehow, you know, a bunch of, fairly soft uh, concretion that's kind of reformed. You wouldn't have to even take a pro came out. You could just drop it and it would turn back into dust and you'd be able to extract the bell from it. So it doesn't make sense on a whole bunch of levels. That's very interesting. Can we see one? Can we see it one more time before we uh... you bet. friends, this is the Newton Anderson Bell. Found in coal, 1945. What does this to say to you? See? So wh when I see something like this, it takes me back in time. It takes me back to a time when the world was very different than today. It takes me back to a time when uh, God had created the world and uh, people were to uh, obey his laws and, and, and sacrifice, uh, eat meats. This was a lot of things that were different in this early earth. Lots of vegetation. Uh, it seemed like there was more, just from analyzing bubbles in amber, probably more oxygen in the air, maybe a little more atmospheric pressure in the air. So plants grew much bigger, taller, and healthier. And honestly, John, we could go on at length about the fossil record, but everything in the yep. fossil record is bigger, healthier, lived longer than modern representatives of the same kinds of animals. And the same with plants. you got 60-foot cattails in the pre-flood world. I mean, things, things are just enormous. So you got all this vegetation, right? And, and then you have man becoming terribly wicked and all the violence. And God says, hey, I, I'm tired of it. I regret that I even made these, these human beings that are so corrupted themselves and I'm going to wipe it all out, right? And when I see this, I think, man, hey, whoever made this bell missed the boat. He did. He was on the wrong side of the ark. And maybe he was hanging this thing and maybe he was even trying to get Noah's attention. Hey, let me on the boat. Or maybe he was hanging in his belt of his garment. Maybe he was a priest, you know, to some, you know, God. And this this little idol is the God or, or part, part of his religious ceremony. And, and so when he dies and his bloated body floats uh, for some time, this bell gets, you know, carried around. A lot, and then finally it drops into some vegetation that eventually becomes West Virginia coal. And mm -hmm. some people said, well, maybe... Maybe West Virginia is the Garden of Eden. Hmm. Well, the Garden of Eden could be anywhere, right? I mean, it's possible that it could be in West Virginia, I guess. But everything got floating all around and changed and carried here and there. And somehow this ended up in a whole bunch of vegetation that got turned to coal. Well, it's metal. It's not going to get turned to coal. Right? But here it is, this ghost, this relic of a pre-flood world. And I'm not even saying it might not be a Garuda Bell in the sense that Maybe there is a demon named Garuda, and he was worshipped in the pre-flood world. Well, he kind of wanted to get that same worship going in the post-flood world. And he went out to the Orient and went far east and got another civilization to make bells of him and worship. You see, a lot of this stuff hasn't changed. Man's wicked heart hasn't changed. Man's disobedience to God hasn't changed. Idolatrous worship hasn't changed. And a lot of these things have stayed the same. And in fact, when we read about uh, the future, this should be a warning to us. 
because God says he's not going to destroy the earth with a flood again, but he's going to destroy it by fire. And we will have another worldwide catastrophe. And just like John, there was an opportunity for everybody to get on that ark, but only Noah and his family chose to get on board. So today there's an opportunity to, to get right with God and to get on an ark that we call Jesus Christ. He is our ark of salvation. He's our place of safety, kind of like the original ark was in Noah's day. And so if we want to be uh, saved from that judgment to come, God's judgment, just judgment on a sin filled world that we need to get right with God or else everything that we've lived for will be burned up it'll be relics left behind this world is going going gone and, and we need to be thinking about the world to come it's appointed a man wants to die and after that the judgment and John and all the viewers we can't take anything with us so when I see something like this I think of a pre-flood world I think of a man that made this maybe Tubal Cain or one of his apprentices I think of God's judgment on sin. Yep. Had to get pretty bad in order to be able to, to have to quarantine, literally quarantine the human race uh, with what little was able to be saved. You know, so, well, thank you for coming on this program to show us this extraordinary artifact. I'm just a huge fan of the Newton Bell, have been for for 18, 19 years now. And it's been a privilege to be able to not only meet you, but also to be able to see it. And again, uh, if those of you that want to check out Dave's website, it's genesispark.com. He's got all sorts of really cool pictures of the bell on there, as well as other things too. I encourage you to go check it out. Well, so, John, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to visit with you, and uh, I, I just want to concur with what you said. Come on out to the website. Let's keep the dialogue going. Uh, one thing's for sure, and that is that this world's passing away. It's not going to last forever. Our time is short. God wants you to have a relationship with him, and he says uh, toward the end of the Bible, says, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life, and God wants you to know you have eternal life. If you don't know that, reach out to John. Reach out to me. We'd love to talk to you. I'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts on the bell or any questions whatsoever. Genesispark.com. And for those of you who are just hearing this for the first time and the jump to, to accept Jesus as your Savior is too big of a jump right at the very moment, start by asking yourself this one simple question, if, if this will be a good uh, gateway for you. Where did we come from? Apes, aliens, or Adam? Start there. Ask the question. Wait for an answer and then go from there. So thank you again, everyone. Dave, thank you. And we'll see you in the next video.